If we're going to turn to John chapter 17, John chapter 17, that's where we left off. Um, and that's where we're going to kind of pick up. Uh, there is a lot in John chapter 17 um, that, we, that we covered. And John chapter 18 is going to be no exception to the rule of John. And that is, you got a lot of ground to cover and a lot that's in it also. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't know if we'll get moved all the way through John 18. I will press kind of hard to move through it. Um, is it working, Charles? I'm assuming not. Okay, it is. Okay. Um, so John chapter 17, and this um, chapter has a lot in, for, in, in it, and we have to, I uh, wanted to kind of remember who was being spoken to and what's being spoken about. And in John chapter 17, of course, we see um, in uh, verse 7, now they know. Now they have come to know that everything you have given uh, me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them, and they receive them, and truly understand that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. And we see that this acceptance of what Jesus says uh, by the apostles is what he's praying about. And he also goes on to say, I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those who you have given me, for they are yours. And all these things are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And then he goes on to talk about um, whenever they are going to, whenever he leaves, the, the Spirit is coming in, and he starts to pray about that as, a, as well. As we continue on, in verse 14, he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And then we um, hit the, in verse 17, where we say sanctification happens. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So whenever someone says, I've been sanctified, what should be the assumption that we hear according to this? <clears throat> they've heard and obeyed the truth. They've heard and they've obeyed the truth. Is that the case in all cases? Absolutely not. Now, why do you think that is? I mean, it's pretty easy here. I mean, that verse 17 says it very plainly. Well, they don't know the truth, and we see that they have been blinded. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's, you know, Satan has kind of stepped in and he blurs the line of truth and he kind of starts changing a little bit about what the words mean. Make it still sound holy, but it's really not. It's still not separated out the way that God wishes it to be separated out. Um, and then um, we see in verse 20 when he starts talking about us. I do not ask on behalf of these alone. Now, who's the these? The apostles, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, there is a bond that happens between Christians. And what is that bond that holds us together? It's that mutual love of God. It's the mutual love of God based in what? In Christ. In Christ, but what you have reading right now is based on that word, on the word. Because without that word, we're just kind of floating through life trying to stumble around and figure out what is love. And what does, you know, what did, we wouldn't know anything about the Holy Spirit if we didn't have the word. And so we see that bond starts to happen at the word. And we also see that those um, apostles, uh, later on, they would uh, preach the gospel to others. They would write these things down as we are reading. They write these things down so that we could come to understand their knowledge of Christ, who he was, and thereby the Father and who he is also. And um, we see uh, in, in verse uh, 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. And it's with that 
uh, understanding and that we're going to kind of segue right into John chapter 18 because if you would remember where does this whole section start uh, here in John chapter 17 you got to back up to John chapter 16 and then you have to back up to where John chapter 15 and then you got to back up where John chapter 14. You see, so a lot of teaching has been going on in 14, 15, 16, and 17. This has all been, a lot of teaching has been going on to his apostles about their mission, and, and he wraps things up in John chapter 17, talking about us who would believe later on, and he says that's where that bond happens. And not only are we bonded to one another, but we're bonded with, with who? With God. And we, we see that in uh, verse 21, that they may all be one, even as you. Now, I assume in verse 21, whenever he says that they may all be one, he's not just talking about the congregation here, but he's talking about us and the apostles. And so this word transcends space and time. And we see that also, if you read the book of 1 John, we see the, the, uh, what true fellowship is it transcends space and time as well. So it's not uh, something that um, you know, can be defined by me and you just sitting across the table having a meal, but fellowship, true fellowship, is both of us walking in the, in the ways of God, just like Christ did, just like the apostles did, and all of that binds us together. So whenever someone steps, steps off of that, they are effectively cutting that fellowship off for themselves. And that's why it's our responsibility, as we pointed out in um, the sermon, I think on Sunday or the uh, Sunday previous, that um, you know that we have an obligation to withdraw fellowship, and so and that is so that the person may see the error and then come back. But it's them that's actually cho chosen now. But we see that uh, here in verse 21. We all want to be one. We're unified by the truth. The truth being the Word of God. All right. Um, let's move on because now we're going to kind of change scenes a little bit. In John chapter 18, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron. Anybody else remember any, any significance of the brook of Kidron? And if you don't, I had to search for it also. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, whenever... Um, David is making his flight out of Israel. It says, And all the land wept aloud as the people passed by, and the king crossed the brook of Kidron, and all the people passed on towards the wilderness. That was really kind of the only significance that I could kind of find uh, of that. But it's in the same place that that's happening. Um, he goes on to say, um, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the ravine of Kidron, where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. And we know that is the Garden of what? Gethsemane. So um, not specific here, but in other, um, other Gospels. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place. For Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So this is somewhere that's very familiar with them, and somewhere that Judas would have known what? Where he was gathered yeah, he knows that he would be there. So we see all of this aligning of, of everything kind of happening in the fact of this betrayal. And then we see in verse 3, Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So it sounds as if they're coming after a thief, a fugitive. And that's the picture that's being painted to us. Uh, one of the great things about the Gospels is giving these little specifics to Brook Kidron and the garden because you can go over today and cross over that exact brook and walk in that exact garden. Now, we don't know the exact spot where he was, but you could be within a few dozen yards of where Jesus and the disciples and all of this unfolded. Right. And what, you know, how magnificent, I guess, to know that that actually happened right here. And, um, you know, like I said, it, it, I, I think, you know, we see in that 
you know, the very specifics of all of those, those types of things that this really happened. This is not, you can actually go there and see where it actually happened. Uh, just like many of the battles that we've had, um, you can go to those battlefields and you know where Gettysburg is and all that kind of stuff because it actually happened there. And here we have the evidence that these things actually happened in these places as well. Go ahead. Yeah, just that it's rooted in history. The religion of Christ is rooted in historical, actual events, places, people, things like that, as opposed to other religions that they're rooted in just someone's philosophy, philosophy that developed over centuries, you know, different things like that. This has historical facts at, at the root of it. Yeah, very good. It's a very good observation. All right, so we see that they're coming out to get this fugitive named Jesus. In verse 4, it says that Jesus, knowing all things, that they were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Who do you seek? And so, is he cowering down? Is he hiding? You know, there's many times that we see, specifically through the book of John, since we've been studying, what does he do whenever a crowd comes to him? Where is he? Where'd he go? You know, he slips out from it. He is not doing that now. Why do you think that is? I mean, he could kind of evade them. It's dark. He says he knows what's coming. It's time. It's time. It, his time has come. And he even goes on, if you read back in John chapter 17, that time has come for me to be glorified and to glorify your name. And so it shows that he is actually going to this cross very willingly. I lay my life down and no one can take it up unless I take it up. But we also see something else being, um, being shown here, and that is in Isaiah chapter 53. How is it that it's described of that in Isaiah chapter 53? What's the, the mood of that? As a lamb, how? Led to the slaughter. Led to the slaughter. You know, just kind of going along with it. Not really kicking and bucking and all that kind of stuff, but he's going along with it, and that's what's bringing um, glory to his Father because it is complete and total submission and obedience. And that's how we ought to be also. Now, in verse 5, they answered him and said, Jesus, of the, Jesus the Nazarene, he said to them, You found him. I am he, and Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So he said to them, I am he. They drew back and fell to the ground. So what's, what's going on here? Why are they, we're looking for this guy. We've got swords, we've got clubs, we've got torches. We're, we're ready to, to bring the fugitive in. Whenever he says, it's me, why do you think they're withdrawing from that? They may have expected somebody of a completely different type of countenance. Okay. Someone who should have been afraid? Yes. Or that he didn't look tough enough to them. Okay. I think in some ways they thought they were going to get somebody that was perhaps a criminal. Right. He didn't look like a criminal. Doesn't look good. No. Go ahead, Stephen. The, the detachment of troops here, uh, there's hundreds of troops. There's the Jewish mob. It's a company and going out there, so it's, it's not like it's 12 on 12, so to speak. Right. <laughs> this is, they have overwhelming superior numbers, but we have to keep in mind that they, they've heard of or maybe personally witnessed all these miracles right. being performed. Besides Judas telling them, hey, you got three guys that are closest to them, they're, they're kind of rowdy, and they don't know what's going to unfold here because historically the prophets. There are times, like a lot to the prophet, you're calling down fire. Right. They're on edge. Yeah, I, and, and, I, and I think that has a lot to do with it because if you read through John, these miracles specifically that he mentions are calls for us to believe that he is the Son of God. So why would we think that it would be any different than, you know, for you know, someone of, um, of that time as well? These were very powerful miracles and something that could not be explained that this man was doing. I mean, he healed the blind. When has that ever been heard of? And so we see all of these things that he was able to do, and we even read in John chapter 20, if you um, move on into John chapter 20, which we won't do that now, but there were so many more miracles, but those he chose just for this book. 
But there were much, many more. And in John chapter 21, it mentions how many. And in so many, the world can't contain the scroll. And so what we see is that they have true angst and fear. And especially, you've got this man, and I do believe this had a lot to do with it. They probably did expect someone to be kind of cowered down, and you've got this guy just walking up saying, I'm the one you're looking for. I mean, that would cause a little bit of concern and red flags from, from me as well. And, um, you know, we also see something else. Um, Jesus has an armed escort. And we're going to see that here shortly. So Judas probably did mention something about, um, you know, watch out for the one that they call Simon Peter because he's a zealot. Um, and then um, we see that uh, in verse 7, Therefore he again asked them, Who do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these go their way. So if I'm the one you're looking for, these men, let them go. And what do they do? They let them go. They don't leave without a fight. But I want to back up just a second before we get there because it says that Jesus made that statement to allow them to go for a very specific reason. In verse 9, what does he say? He had, he had said that he had prayed. You know, all you've given me, I've lost none, except for the son of perdition. Right. Or he's on the other side here, but the rest of them, they need to flee, they need to escape. Yeah, and he's losing Judas to the world. I mean, we see that very clearly here, what's going on with what's going on. Um, in John chapter 17 and verse 12 is where he mentions this. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I have guarded them. And not one of them perished but the son of perdition, so the scriptures will be fulfilled. And so we see that prayer that he had, he made, he made the fulfillment of that by making that statement, just let these guys go. Now, Peter, being Peter, is not going to allow, he ain't going to go down quietly and just kind of walk away because remember what he told Jesus previous to all of this. And that was what? Even, I'll never leave you. Even if you die, I'm going with you. And so Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times. This is Peter's way of saying, that ain't going to happen. So, it says in verse 10, uh, Simon Peter then having a sword drew it back and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear and the slave's name was Malchus. Um, now he's got a pretty good uh, aim. I don't think that you know he meant to cut this guy's ear off. I mean, I don't think that he was um, missed what his, his target here. And um, so what do we see in verse 11? Jesus, yep, put it away. We don't need that. Put, put the sword in the sheath. The, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Now, what is he talking about this cup? What well, he knew what to expect, and it was bitter. How, how so? How is it bitter? I think there's a part of Jesus that, for maybe a second, didn't want to didn't want things to have to be this way, but he knew that they didn't have to be this way. And he was hoping maybe something else could happen. What does sin do? What does sin do between our relationship and God? It cuts it off. It cuts it off. And it brings God's what upon us? Wrath. God's wrath. If you will, turn to Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 22. Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 22. Thus says the Lord, the Lord <clears throat> thus says your Lord, the Lord your God, who pleads the cause of his people, behold, I have taken from your hand the cup of staggering, the bowl of my wrath, you shall drink no more. And what we see here is this bowl of wrath that he was giving upon 
um, the nation because of their evil. But there will come a time that that is going to be subsided. So what I believe what Jesus is talking about here when he says, shall I not drink the cup which has been given to me, and that is he is looking in that cup of wrath because he is about to place himself between God and mankind and forever change things between that relationship because all of that sin is going to be placed on him on that cross. And God's wrath will be there also. And so he's having to look into that cup and... He is the only in all of creation that can do this. And so I think that he's making mention of that. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, places that, that we could look at, but I think that kind of suffices at least the idea that, that I get uh, when, he, when he makes that statement. Um, shall I not drink it, this cup that he's given me? Uh, I've also read a couple of places where he is just uh, using the figurative language of this is kind of the cards that have been dealt to me type of thing. But I believe it has more to do with uh, going back to Isaiah and that idea of drinking that cup of wrath. Any questions or comments? Either way, he tells Peter, this is not the way that God wants things. And you can see, again, how, God, how he is glorifying God because if he would have cut the ear off of Malchus and Jesus wouldn't have said anything and just kind of let a battle ensue here, would that have shown his submission to what God was asking him? It would not have. Verse 12, so the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas, he was the one who advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. And he said that, why did he say that? He was afraid the Romans were going to come and remove them from power because Jesus was gaining such a, a huge influence. Right. And so he makes this statement, and it actually says it was actually a prophecy, and it, uh, he says, you know, you, you guys know nothing. It's better for one man to die. Is it better for one man to die or for the entire nation to be destroyed? And so what we see is uh, this kind of coming to pass. Um, and now this is it. So Jesus is very familiar with these guys. And um, we see that he's taken to Annas first, who's the brother or the father-in-law of Caiaphas. All right, so it says Simon Peter started following from Jesus from a distance now. And so Jesus kind of pulls the rein on him. This isn't how I want to, um, I, I want this night to go. And so you're going to have to put your sword away because that's not how um, God will win this battle. And we see in verse 15, Simon Peter was following Jesus and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside, so the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. So he was able to get Peter in. And we see in verse 17, then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of the man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. So we see this first denial. Now you would think that possibly Peter would have, something would have, you know, snapped for Peter. And perhaps it did, I don't know. But what we see here is that at one point I'm ready to go to the sword, and now I'm told, no, that's not the way that, um, that God works. So what does that tell us about Peter and his reliance upon violence?
Wouldn't it show that's the only way that he kind of knows how to get out of this situation and perhaps this is how he defends God? Right. He, he was like the others, like the Jews in general. They thought the kingdom would be established by physical power, political power, battles, wars, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so he's got that in his mindset. And in those parallel accounts, it shows that after he had drawn that sword, after the Lord rebuked him and said, put it up, that when they took Jesus into custody, that all the rest of them fled. Right. There's, there's fear that all of a sudden floods over them. And Peter going in here now, he's, he's trying to go in incognito. Like, I, I don't want to end up where he's going. Right. He knew what was unfolding at this point. Right. You know, and I'm and I'm glad you brought up about the kingdom because that that I believe is why he had that sword. Because he really believed that the kingdom of God is something of flesh and blood. And if you read on into John chapter um, 18, we'll see that discussion happen between Jesus and Pilate and about what the kingdom of God is. So there's a huge misunderstanding um, or a disconnect between what the kingdom of God is in the minds of people, what they expect, and what it actually is. And I, I believe that has a lot to kind of play in here. You know, Peter probably sees himself as a soldier of, of God, but yet that's not how God delivers. And this is a lesson that he's now having to learn. And so we see that you know he doesn't he doesn't know how to react to this now you know that his he's been disarmed, and so we see that now it's like no I'm I'm not of him how do I defend myself if I'm not supposed to use my sword you know and um, no I'm I'm not one of his, and then it says the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter you are not also one of this man's disciples are you and he said no I'm not now the slaves and the officers were standing there having made a charcoal fire for it was cold and they were warming themselves and Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. So here's the man who said, I will never leave you. And he tried to prove that point with a sword. Jesus tells him that is not how you prove that you're standing with me. But now look at where we are. And a lot of times we are the exact same way. We kind of keep Jesus at a distance. And we want to continue to kind of warm ourselves by the fire, you know. But just kind of keep him at a distance. And we don't really want people to know that we're associated with him. And, you know, we, we play that out on a daily basis. And so we have to kind of keep that in mind whenever we're very rough on Peter and saying, well, I would never deny, <laughs> deny uh, God. And yet we do on a daily basis. And so we have to understand that we interject ourselves into the Scriptures here. All right, so he's warming himself by the fire. He's nice and warm. And then it says in verse 19, the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teachings. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together and I spoke nothing in secret. So, when the question comes up about his teaching and things like that, what is his answer to that? He's been very upfront. Yeah, uh, he doesn't. He didn't hide. He did it right, right in the open, where everyone could see and hear. Now he was in the synagogue and in the temple, um, but he he was very upfront. He didn't hide it. Yeah, he, he never uh, hid and said, I, I've done nothing in secret. If you will, turn to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 19. And see if this sounds familiar with what we just heard. Isaiah 45 and verse 19. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. So does that sound very familiar with the answer that was given to them? So how is Jesus answering them? Let's see. 
basically he's he's almost recording old scripture. Yeah, he is. That's exactly what he's doing. And in Isaiah chapter uh, 48, verse 16, it says, Draw near to me, hear this, from the beginning I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there, and now the Lord God has sent me in His Spirit. And so we see this idea being or the, the Scriptures in Isaiah now being played out with Jesus' answer. I haven't done anything in secret. I've been everywhere that, um, that you've been. Uh, you had an opportunity to question me then. And I, I've been in the temple. I spoke nothing in secret. I have been very upfront and open. And then in verse 21, why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. So his answer to them is, I spoke what was truth. I did not hide it. I was not looking to, you know, I, I proclaimed it everywhere. As a matter of fact, previous to this in John, what do we see Jesus doing out there basically on the steps of the temple? Proclaiming loudly, I am the way, the truth, the life, the, you know, and all of those things. I mean, so he definitely was not doing anything in the spirit. You know, why do you question me? Question me, question those who have heard what I spoke. They know what I said. Who would that include? Well, it definitely would be his disciples. It would be actually the high priest. They've all seen him. Hurting. They can't deny what, what he said because they, they've been right there. They've heard. Right. Very good. Well, even in the previous week, he had debated in the temple, he had taught in the temple, the, the leaders, whether the, the high priest himself or other uh, chief priest, they, they heard it, they knew it. He, he had not been seditious, as we might say, going under the cover and doing these things, but he had been openly declaring, and that's the reason there's the conflict here. Right. right. And, you know, and I point that out because his question of, why do you question me? You were there. You know what I said. Why don't you round up the people who heard? Why don't you question them? Because that is a lot of people. And I think he's all, what he's also saying is, if this was done in secret, how many witnesses would you have? Just a couple, right? But you question all the people who heard what I said. You bring all of those people in here, and you'll see it wasn't done in secret. It was done out in public. And so a couple of things that, you know, I think that he's saying there, them being part of that group that heard these things. When he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus saying, is that the way you answer the high priest? Don't answer a question with a question. What are you doing? So Jesus answered him, if I've spoken wrongly, testify the wrong. But if rightly, why are you striking me? So there is great tension. And even Jesus, as we read in Isaiah chapter 53, we, we read that in Isaiah chapter 53, and we kind of get this idea of him just kind of slowly and quietly going, but that is really not what's going on here. He is still confronting the error. He is still showing them, you are doing this completely wrong. And by these questions that he's asking, and by the statement that he just made, if I just said something wrong, it bring out the witnesses that say that. If not, why are you striking me? In other words, you are violating your own law. Go ahead, Stephen. He's, in doing this, he's not resisting what's happening. Correct. He's laying bare the injustice and the hypocrisy. Yeah, I think that's a, that's um, articulated well. Is that you know he's going along with the process, but he's also showing the errors of the process as well. So Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So what is Annas basically admitting here? Well, he he has to do this. Uh, Annas is is the high priest in the Jews' eyes. He's the one that holds massive influence 
among them. Caiaphas is the one the Romans had appointed, so he has to get this legal check right. box to, to take that next step. Right. And he's having a hard time dealing with this also, obviously. Just and you, you have one man just kind of standing there and he's not really he, he's just saying, let's have a fair trial. If you want a fair trial, let, let's do this. Bring those people out. You don't have them. You know, I mean, I haven't done anything in secret, so there's plenty of them. Now, before you, and we see this um, in John chapter 3, whenever we turn all the way back there, and we see a, a certain man by the name of Nicodemus, and he comes to Jesus by night, and he's asking a lot of questions. Now, why is he asking questions? Verse 2. Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. We know, as the Pharisees, we understand that. And now here we are in John chapter 18, and Anna says, send him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Verse 25, now Simon Peter was standing warming himself so they said to him, You're not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, so he's already in way over his head now, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Aren't you the guy that drew the sword? Aren't you the... Malchus is my cousin. Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Three times that he denied it, and then the rooster crows. Okay, sorry. Um, and what we see here in this is this um, story of Peter kind of being wrapped up. And in verse 28, then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early. And they themselves did not enter into the Praetorium, why? Or you don't want to be unclean. You can't enter into the house of a Gentile and expect you to remain clean. And that's really, those types of laws are the ones that God's more uh, worried about rather than justice and peace and those types of things. Do you think, too, that maybe they were also, um, that became an issue because they saw how he spoke to the Gentiles and not just the Jews in his teaching? No, it was, a, it was part of their rule. As a matter of fact, if you turn to Acts chapter 10, that was a problem that Peter would have had as to going to uh, Cornelius' house because he would have been unclean, which is why he had that vision before saying no things are unclean and Peter even says that in Acts chapter 10 because going into that situation would have made them unclean and so that's what they're referring to here that you have these idolaters and stuff like that and you're not even supposed to be around them and so it would have made them unclean but we see the hypocrisy that is now kind of going on in, in all of this I can't enter the praetorium because that'll, that'll defile me. However, I'm going to throw a monkey trial. And that's okay. So, um, we see kind of the, the whole setting of, of what's going on um, here in, in this. Oh, one second, I'm looking for a uh, scripture. If you will, turn to Micah chapter 7. Um, and we see something in here in Micah chapter 7 and verse, uh, in verse we'll start in verse 7 
But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the Lord, of the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not over me, my, O oh, my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light. I shall look upon his vindication. Then my enemy will see. The shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will look upon her, and now she will be trampled down like the mire of the streets. A day for the building of your walls, and the day of boundary shall be flat extended. In that day they will come to you from Assyria and the cities of Egypt, and I won't continue on. But what we see here is this idea of this man of God is going to be slain, he's going to, be, he's going to fall because of his enemies. However, he's going, to be, he's going to rise again. And when we see this and exactly what, what they're doing here and what's about to happen here, and that is they're handing him over to godless men, is exactly what we kind of see played out in Micah 7 and in numerous other um, scriptures as well. And how they can't really see this is kind of, it's unfathomable to us. But we have the complete picture. We kind of we kind of see everything at a ma macro level, and so. But these scriptures exist about all the injustice and stuff like that that we see throughout the nation of Israel's history, and it's being played out here. They're so worried about them being defiled before God because of another human being. However, they are treating the Son of God, and we saw John chapter 3 and what uh, Nicodemus said, we know that you are. And they're defiling themselves that way. And a lot of what's being stated here in John chapter 18, whenever Jesus gives his, um, his answers, you know, why, you know go, go get the people. And so, but, uh, you know, I just want to kind of point out, you know, just the injustice that's about to happen. Um, because they didn't want to defile themselves, but might eat the Passover. Now remember what the Passover was for? Yeah, you know, that God spared their lives. And, you know, so it says in, in verse uh, 29, Therefore Pilate went out to them, so he's making accommodations, and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. How much evidence has been given so far? And so, I think it's a good question that, you know, <laughs> you bring a man up to my, to my place, you know, up to my door. I want to know what, what, what's going on here. And um, they said, well, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to them, well, then take him yourselves. If he's, if he's an evildoer, judge him according to your law. And then the Jews said, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. So, again, we don't know what the charge is that Pilate is supposed to judge upon, but we do know that the Jews are seeing it worthy of what? Worthy of death. Now, do you remember... There was a lady that they brought to Jesus and said she has been caught in the very act of adultery. What do you say needs to happen to her? And remember what they had. Well, we didn't really see any rocks or anything like that, but we saw that they asked for Jesus to give her the death penalty. They didn't take her over here to Pilate. What's why the difference here? Because they knew they were wrong in what they were doing. Well they were wrong and also the the adulterous woman was not really a threat to them. Right, but Jesus was to them. Absolutely. And so we're bringing him up here to you, Pilate, because our law will not uh, allow us to put him to death. And that certainly was not true. As a matter of fact, their law told them that you need to put people to death. You know, stone, you know, uh, stone them and stuff like that. But 
So what they are saying is we are actually submitting to whose law? To the Romans. To the Romans' law. But yet they call it our law. You see how the confusion? And you see that how they are supposed to be leading the children of Israel into obeying God's law and how they are not doing that? But instead, their allegiance is to their own self-gratification, their own um, ambitions, and, and to Caesar. And uh, we see in verse uh, 31, the pilots said, Take with yourselves. They said, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. In verse 32 it says, To fulfill the word of Jesus which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. They said that to show what type of death Jesus was about to die, that he's already said. So what does that say? And why do you think John put that in there? I think it was to show that they really understood what they were doing, even though they knew they were wrong, because they knew they were wrong. They just weren't going to admit it. Yeah, and... Well, John puts this in here, and if you will remember, um, back in John, I think it was about 16, um, where he says, you know, I'm leaving, and you're going to have to go through some things, and whenever that time comes, you're going to know I told you this previous to that time coming. And so there are certain things that John writes down previous to this point so that we will know also that Jesus is the Son of God. He said these things were going to happen. Now, how could anyone possibly know that these things were going to happen unless God was with him? Go ahead. Back all the way up to John chapter 3, where it's recorded, you know, that he would be lifted up. Correct. And that's, that's pointing to this to, right. here. He knew he wasn't going to die by stone. He was going to die by crucifixion, which the Romans did not much. Right. And I think, you know, and that's why I believe John wrote that in there to fulfill the words that Jesus had said. Now, if he, had he left that out of there, we may not have picked that up. But whenever they are handing him over, he is referring right back to John chapter 3. Um, all right, so verse 33, Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? It's a pretty straightforward question. So let's give a straightforward answer. Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative? Or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? So at that point, still, what has not been, what's, what's very muddy and unclear for Pilate? Exactly why? 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 Yeah. Why are you here? He's trying to figure out why did they bring this man who they say has done something worthy of death. Why is he standing in front of me right now? He is trying to, you know, gather up some type of fact. What have you done that they would bring you here? Because I can't get anything out of them. And then we see in verse, uh, 30, uh, verse 35, I'm not a Jew, am I? I'm your own nation, you know, what have you done? And in verse 36, this is what we were referring to earlier about Peter uh, not really understanding what the kingdom is. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. What did he just do? In, what did he just explain for Pilate about Peter? That Peter was incorrect in the way that he saw the kingdom of God. Peter did believe that Jesus was the Son of God, but he thought that his kingdom was coming by the power of the sword. Jesus says very plainly here, that is not how I run my kingdom. It is not of this world. If it were of this world, then I'd have a whole bunch of Peters over here, and you wouldn't be standing here with me. However, that's not the way it is. He's differentiating that there's, there's no army. Correct. There's no army. Well, he's, he's differentiating the fact that it's a spiritual kingdom. It is not an earthly kingdom. 
It's not a kingdom of, of what Pilate would understand. My kingdom's not of this world. If it were, I would have people around me, correct? Yeah, well, they're not around me. So my kingdom is not of this world. Therefore, Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born. And for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And so again, this idea of going back to the words, his, what, his, what he must do, what he came to the earth to do. And then Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. So the correct judgment has been given. There's no evidence. There's nothing. I may not understand this whole situation you Jews have got going on with this whole kingdom thing. However, he's, there's nothing he's done wrong. And then he makes this offer to him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish then that I release for you the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. And now Pilate, his confusion is really going to set in. So we'll go ahead and end there. I know we're out of time. There's a lot in John chapter 18, or John chapter, uh, yeah, John chapter 18, going into 19. Um, but you can kind of see this monkey trial that's already starting. No, you know, there's no witnesses to anything. They don't because if they gather up all the witnesses, what are they going to get? They're going to get witnesses to, that shows that he was out in the public doing this. There's no accusations of what he's done wrong. No evidence of anything. Pilate is seen through this. And he's actually offering them a way out of this situation. And himself as well. So we'll see how that kind of plays out. Any questions or comments? Again, I know there's a lot packed in there. And we could have went to a lot of other scriptures as well. All right. Good discussion. I'm going to close out the class.